Classroom. And I am about to hand it over to our presenter, Marilyn Hoyt. Uh, Marilyn is active nationally and internationally teaching, consulting, and advising nonprofits. She speaks frequently at conferences and consults to two foundations. Uh, she, in her past work, she spent 12 years as a grant maker for the Westchester Arts Council in New York and the Washington State Arts Commission. She also was a fundraising consultant for a lot of different nonprofits for J.C. Giver Incorporated and spent 20 years at the New York Hall of Science as uh, founding staff. Uh, she was the head of advancement and ultimately was the president and CEO. And she is one of the authors of the Foundation Center's book, After the Grant. She's also a frequent presenter for the Foundation Center, teaching our whole uh, proposal writing curriculum. And I'm going to go ahead and put her on the line so that uh, she can take over. So I'm just going to bring up her presentation. And then I will tune in again when we're doing the Q&A. Thank, Thank you, Thank Carolyn. You, Carolyn. Um, reality, reality fundraising, fundraising I think, I think for most, for of, most us, of us um, has to do a lot, do a lot with, with um, using, um, our, using time our time to the, to the best, best advantage. advantage. So, so finding, finding that, that next, next dollar, dollar for our, our organization. organization. So, today so today we're, we're going, going to look, to look at, at um, what, what are the cues we have to tell us where is the next, the next dollar? dollar, how can we, how can we use our time wisely. wisely. And for those of us who think well, I well, wish I was a full-time full -time development, development person, person like those uh, colleagues, colleagues who answered, who answered that. that. Uh, uh, and, I'm and I'm a program person, person, I'm an executive, I'm an executive director. director. I think we're, I think all, we're all in the same boat. boat. Um, um, there, are there are actually more opportunities, more opportunities or at least ideas around, ideas around fundraising than there are hours to pursue them. them. So we're going, so we're to, going start to start with the notion that we look first at how our fundraising options are influenced, are influenced by, by national, national trends. trends. And there are and some, national some national trends that I can't, I can't uh, address, address today, today because, because they get right into proposal, proposal writing, writing themselves. themselves. I bet you've run them. into them. Uh, the, uh, the increase in, 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 in the electronic, electronic applications, applications uh, the, desire uh, the desire for outcomes as opposed, as opposed to just um, uh, evaluation, evaluation, the desire, the desire for, us for us to collaborate or even merge. But there's, but there's some, some that we can, that we can all address today, today which, which is, is to look, to look at, at what's going, going on nationally in terms, in terms of, of actual, actual, um, actual, um, actual funding. funding. Where, Where is, it? is it? Now, now here, here is, is a pie chart, pie chart that, you that you could look at every, every year, year for many, many years, years um, uh, in Giving USA. And I should note that the Foundation Center, who is sponsoring um, this webinar, uh, is, is the provider of the information on foundations and corporate foundations. So here's our great big pie of total giving. That total giving has been, not surprisingly, pretty flat um, through these most recent um, years of the recession. But here's, here's why I am beginning to feel pretty optimistic going forward. Most foundations especially, but I think also individuals of wealth who are very major donors, um, will tend to give based on a rolling average of some sort. And it's usually about three years. So 2012 is the first year that horrible, awful 2008 is not figured into um, their thinking about their giving. Now this pie chart for those of us in the arts, I think can, can be a problem. Um, maybe one of our trustees or, or a senior staff gets their hands on it and they go, oh my gosh, why are you writing foundation grants? Why aren't you going after planned gifts or going after individuals? Look, all the money is with individuals. Well, those of us in the arts are not seeing a pie chart that looks quite like this. Um, that big 73% of individuals and even bequests is not surprisingly dominated by higher education and health and hospitals. Uh, and um, these are places that see um, someone go to school for four years and then they are alumni forever, or someone becomes ill and the family is really saved. So they have a very different relationship with their donors, individual donors, than we do in arts institutions where we tend to go out and make our friends one by one. So here's a chart I like better. 
It comes from American for the Arts, and if you go on their website, you'll see even more data. And here we see a story that's probably closer to at least some of us here. Um, one of the things that's happened during the recession is we've all started paying more attention to earned income. And those of us in the arts can earn through what we do, or often we have spaces that we can uh, rent or use in other ways to earn income. Um, here you also see uh, that there's still um, serious money in individuals. And that's, again, looking across the, the entire sector. Some of us may find that, that we're well positioned to go after major gifts, and others still not at all. The main thing that we might notice, if we were to compare this to the past, and we're not going to take time to do that, is that government support of the arts, which uh, if we look back at the last 40 years, um, was higher than it is now. Um, it is because of the problems with uh, government income, taxes going down, smaller than it's been uh, probably since the mid-70s. So let's look at government funding for the arts. Um, federal is flat or slightly negative with one big exception. Those of us who are positioned to take part in education uh, with STEM, which is science, technology, uh, engineering and math and add the arts in a meaningful way may find that we're well positioned to gain new grants in, uh, from the federal uh, sources. And I'd like to note that those are unlikely to come from the National Endowment for the Arts or the National Endowment for the Humanities, traditional places that we went to. We may want to partner up uh, with a local school district or with a local science center and go for National Science Foundation or National Institutes of Health SEPA money. States by and large are negative, but I sure would talk to my colleagues because they're not all negative. Negative meaning funding trending down. Many arts councils, state arts councils, are having a very hard time, but not all of them. So um, keep networking. Local across the country, again, because local government and county government um, are seeing their tax revenues go down, uh, has tended to be flat or slightly negative through 2011, 2012. But again, there are, I see capital grants churning up, especially when we have something to offer to a business district or tourism. And again, um, steam churning up. Another way to look at what is the economic story around us, what is the context, is to look at U.S. private job growth. And I wouldn't worry about it by months. I just brought you this chart because I think it's very helpful to re be reminded how bad 2008 and 9 were and how kind of slowly we have crept back. That said, one of the things that we are hearing in the endless harangue uh, around the political climate right now at the national level is that unemployment is actually going down. And this is good for us. Uh, that's a leading indicator for a whole lot of uh, positive economic activity, which should help bring those government sources back. And we can track our own key trends. Um, I'm a big fan of taking the local newspaper, and if you have a business newspaper, taking that. Uh, particularly corporations um, tend to trumpet what they do, and it's a great real-time way to find out what's going on. Uh, I hope all of us are colleagues in a national field, our organization's field, and we can talk to our colleagues around the country and see what they're seeing in terms of fundraising trends. Likewise, uh, there are national conferences, but there are also uh, conferences for those of us, or even luncheons, who are in professional associations like the uh, Association of Fund Fundraising Professionals, or even luncheons we put together ourselves. What the heck? So uh, I think we should be networking like crazy. When things are as volatile as they are now, but they're starting to grow, the opportunities will emerge so fast, and if we're behind the door, we'll miss them. We want to be talking to each other. Now, at the end of the day, the best use of our time in terms of looking at technical research for foundations, corporate foundations, companies, and those family foundations who, who give money as essentially major gifts 
is to continue to use the tools provided by the Foundation Center. And I want to be sure that I note the Philanthropy News Digest is free, Foundation Rectory Online, the incredible weekly updated search engine is free if you go to one of the 450 libraries and you can search by your own zip code on their website and find the nearest one. And then follow, as you are today, uh, chats, blogs, and webinars. Now, another piece that influences how, where we should go next for money and how much we can raise is us, our organization's own maturity. So if I'm just starting a dance company in Queens, I probably am not going to have the same donor profile as the Metropolitan Museum of Art or New York City Ballet. Here is a list of the kinds of income we tend to have in the very early years of our organization. And I should note that those of us who, who have had a mature organization and it came close to going out of business in 2008, 2009, may find ourselves um, in this world again, where if we can prove that someone wants to buy our services, perhaps in education, uh, perhaps through visitation, it will help us um, win money from other sources. Our board may very well be actually functioning as staff in some areas. And those can range from social media uh, to actually coming in and running the admissions desk. Board giving is really critical. It's critical because we need the money, and it's critical because it demonstrates that we have real commitment on our, our board. Uh, volunteers at this point are often also doing staff function. Uh, the kinds of work that later on we may hire someone to do. In-kind gifts of space, of goods, of services um, uh, can very well, again, cover for a lack of fundraising capacity at this point. Social media, particularly if we include a group of either those we serve or those who take an interest in us who are under 40, can be really effective in beginning to build a brand and maybe even to attract money. And events, often low-cost events uh, done with space and supplies and leadership provided by our board and volunteers, again, can help us tell our story, build our brand, and raise money. And here is actually a wonderful new young dance company in Queens. Um, and the only note I want to make here is they are exactly in that profile we just talked about, but it doesn't mean that they can't uh, accomplish a lot. Uh, the number of services they give on their own are only a handful every year, but they are now partnering with um, partners ranging from other arts organizations to Goodwill Industries to deliver um, both training and performances and they have caught the eye of the serious dance community and already been invited to two national festivals, of one of which they attended with in-kind cars provided by Zipcar. So starting out doesn't mean you're ineffective. It just means you have to be very smart about uh, matching resources to expenses so that you don't end up going out of business before you figure out what your business model will be. So now we're down the line, and we see the main change here is our, our board is now trans, trans, um, translating itself from being essentially quasi-staff to beginning to open doors for us, to help us build a brand, to help us reach out to funders. And these are traditionally individuals, uh, corporate and foundation funders, uh, and to help with events. Hopefully we're working on board development. So our board is becoming more diverse and picking up some horsepower, uh, which means that they can open more doors and, and as a group can give larger gifts. Now volunteers may still be doing the same kinds of things that they were doing in our early on organization, uh, but there are probably more of them because we're doing a higher volume of programming. And in kind, the same story, probably the same kind of stuff and services and um, leadership we got early on, but perhaps more of it. Social media 
because it costs money to maintain a quality website, uh, to really keep track of Twitter and Facebook and all of these other pieces, we may be either adding media or just being more proactive in, in uh, tracking the response to our social media. Uh, events we're probably beginning to pick, on, pick up more standard fundraising events, whether it's walkathons because we have a great constituency of kids and their family to help, or the classic corporate or social gala. So we're beginning to spend a little bit of money on our events as opposed to uh, early on trying to have no cost events and we're seeking to raise more money. Now by now, we have a track record of activity and an audience significant enough that we can justify to potential grant funders uh, that we're a going concern and grants start to kick in. Hopefully we've also kept track of everyone who has come near us for these years and we're uh, running at least an end of the year annual fund ap appeal. And it may well be that we're beginning to uh, compete for government grants. Um, many arts commissions want us to be a few years old before we come in, but with our track record we can and we can win those grants. So here's an example here of the San Francisco, San Francisco Girls Chorus. The San Francisco Girls Chorus is actually a very old institution, a very old organization, but it was embedded in the orchestra. It moved out of the orchestra in the last decade or so uh, and essentially uh, started as a maturing institution. It wasn't a baby, but it's worked really hard to make all the kinds of income we just talked about uh, available to its work and has even um, uh, put together and succeeded with a capital campaign. And now we have a mature institution. Again, this is kind of the Chinese menu. Uh, everything we saw before, the board now really uh, deeply strengthened, able to open serious doors, and also hopefully to give serious money in the context of our budget. Um, skipping down event fundraising, hopefully again we can really bring that up with the door opening to either social or corporate honorees that boards bring. Grants, we have a full-fledged staffed grants uh, fundraising program and we have the story of quality work behind it to uh, assure funders that if they partner with us, not only will our priorities be met, but theirs also. And the annual fund we hope is big enough that we can turn it into a set of giving clubs and begin to uh, add major gifts, which you see down there a couple steps below, as the top of our annual fund. Now, once we have a major gift that has gone on, a major donor has gone on for three, five, seven years, that, that individual may very well be committed enough to us to want not only to fund our programs and the services that we do to make life better for someone, but also to give us an endowment gift or a planned gift, an estate gift, uh, which, which ensures that we will always be able to do that kind of work. And here's an example in Atlanta, the Atlanta Botanical Garden, and you can see that they are physically large. Um, this is true of uh, performing arts and museums, although if we were a mature community arts council, we would not have an enormous plant. So being enormous doesn't mean that we're mature. It means that we have all these income streams um, moving against ever larger expenses for higher quality and more work. So how do I find that next available dollar? If we're looking for individual money, whether we are just starting out or um, maturing or mature, peers of our board members and friends of the board are always going to be of great interest to us. Uh, we'll look at those who use our services. Uh, and some of us serve only the poor. And I'd like to urge you, going back um, to the pie chart that is stressing earned income, to think really hard about uh, including more economically able individuals in our services. Uh, it's not impossible to keep an arts organization going that only serves the poor, but it's very, very difficult to grow. 
um, can we consider pour, putting economically able people into our services? And then scholarship, our traditional audience. Uh, can we put some of those same services that have been so popular with individuals who are economically disadvantaged in neighborhoods where uh, economically advantaged people live? Um, these are big cultural shifts for us, but we are being required to change by these times, and we need to think of these kinds of questions. Family and friends of those who use our services are often parents and grandparents of youth. That's the traditional model. But I'd look further if I were you. You know your organization much better than I do. And again, the foundation directory online uh, has all the family foundations. And many uh, individuals make their major gifts through these foundations. So it's always worth searching on uh, the people who came to your event, pop them into the trustee box of the foundation directory's grant maker section. Just see if they have a family foundation there. Um, likewise, you can, you can get donor software that looks specifically at individuals, or you can outsource those searches. Business, corporate dollars, and in-kind, that's where the clipping really goes to work. Um, companies have changed a lot through this period, and I think they're going to change again. Um, they went to over half of their monies being given in-kind to now less than half. So this is something to watch. And because businesses and corporations rarely give anonymously, we can, we can put a Google alert on the name of a company or we can clip in real time in our local business journals. And again, you can look, use the foundation directory online to search for uh, grants. Um, and I want to really point out that there's a, a wonderful and often overlooked section. You can search on the subsidiaries of companies. You know those big, white, rust-colored towers that sit by a railroad tracks on the edge, edge of every town? Those belong often to big, philanthropic companies. And by searching on subsidiaries, you'll find them. You'll know that there are employees in town. And that's a great way to expand your uh, list of potential corporate fundees. Staff to staff. Uh, I like business and corporate fundraising uh, because we are free to give a call, uh, ask staff to give a call to the staff of a corporate foundation. Um, they're used to hearing from us. Uh, they don't expect very often to hear from a trustee, and so um, this is a place we can move quickly. That said, the board uh, or our volunteers can be door openers. Uh, there's nothing like having a trustee or one of our volunteers send a quick email to the foundation head or corporate giving head saying, I'm aware that um, the XYZ found, um, nonprofit with whom I work has a proposal in, and if I can help arrange a meeting, or assist in any way to, in review, let me know. This ensures that uh, your proposal will be read. And you know, given the volume of asking, not getting read is one of our great challenges. So it's a great way to get through. Foundation grants, again, I'd like to clip real-time local information. I set Google alerts on both the foundations who fund me and those I'd like to fund me. You'll only get an e-note when something comes up. And the foundation directory online allows us many ways to search. Um, by the way, uh, most cooperating collections, there are over 450 of them, of the foundation center periodically do free research clinics an hour or two. And it's worth going to one of those or sending one of your staff or volunteers. Because um, I guarantee you from personal experience, I think about this pretty much all the time, and nonetheless, I learn something every time I go to one of those workshops. Um, this business of opening doors, uh, I think sometimes we think is like lobbying, uh, but it's not lobbying at all. Uh, very often, it is sending around a list to our board and maybe either some other funders and volunteers, a list of prospects who we researched. They seemed like such naturals to fund us. Uh, a list of the name of that, organ of that foundation, uh, the contact person and their board, and saying, do you know anyone here? Uh, get back to you to set next steps if you do. Now, what happens when they say, yes, I know someone. That's my former uh, next door neighbor. will call and say, thank you so much for letting us know. And as this proposal goes out, 
I'll send you a copy. There's a chance they may recognize your involvement here, uh, and then you can help make a meeting or whatever it is they want. Now, what happens when we send a copy of something um, to someone in standard business practice? We put a carbon copy. So the cop carbon copy would say Joanne Snow, trustee. And what that tells the person opening the mail at the foundation is that this proposal from someone they may never have heard of will nonetheless um, merit a review because someone might know someone there. Now, we've given a phone call before that proposal came in, but a little boost over the hump of getting read when we know that they are telling us, these foundations, that they cannot read every proposal is a very powerful tool uh, for, for going into review. Government funding. Government grants. I want all of us to be networking with experienced colleagues. Um, this world, uh, even though it has always forms and guidelines, uh, priorities and nuances, nuances of priorities, we really want to understand what's going on. And the nice thing about government grants and the arts um, is that they're easily searchable on the funder's websites. And often there are even copies of successful grants there and webinars for how to apply. Um, it's generally easy to go and visit uh, a government program officer. And I'd like to note that if we're asking for hundreds of thousands of dollars um, for a large government grant, we, we ought to be able to cough up a few hundred to get on a plane and go visit our uh, program officer. There is no free lunch here. Government contracts tend to happen at the local level. And particularly if we are working with youth, um, I would really look at, at the contracts that traditionally go to after-school programs, uh, to YMCAs, uh, to even daycare centers. Um, they may be wired into this before we were, but many of us are doing very, very similar work and could win one of those contracts. Government discretionary funding is a very polite way to talk about pork. We've all heard about pork, and we've all been told it's gone away, but it is never going to go away, and that's for actually a very good reason. There is no, no government money for many things that our communities need, and our elected officials, whether it's sewers or help for an art center to set up a, a badly needed summer program, um, they need to be able to bring these kinds of resources to their community. So I would uh, first time out, generally take a trustee who is involved with a, or a volunteer who's involved with a particular elected official. They'll almost always hand us off to a legislative aid, and that's just fine. Let's move it forward. This money may not be big in the beginning, um, like not big, $1,200, $2,500, but it tends to be very consistent as long as that elected official um, is in office. And you can build a portfolio of these kinds of small grants to help um, their constituency in a particular way. And they are inexpensive to maintain the relationship. And they can move forward through time and build up in the same way that an annual fund does. So I wouldn't walk away from this small funding. Events. We talked about um, the beginning organization working with uh, no-cost events. And I cannot tell you how important it is not to spend money that you do not have on events. Until you know one, how one pays for you, they can be really dicey. But down the line, when we have horsepower in our trustees and they can win us high-quality honorees on the corporate or the social side, people who, um, who are, are essentially um, sought by those who um, win their money, like banks or lawyers, um, or those who would like to be in their circle, can be um, very powerful ways of raising significant money at a cost less than 30 cents on the dollar. Volunteer-driven, the key is to make sure that we either have a, a great volunteer to lead this very uh, time-intensive activity, or we have staff set aside uh, to, to look at it. And we really looked at what that staff costs and what we hope to raise. Consumer marketing, 
this business of, oh, there's an Outback Steakhouse opening in town. We're going to let all our members, our audience know that during the month of April they can go, and if they buy a bloom and onion, um, you know, $3 goes to our arts organization. I think those are great ways to uh, be a good community citizen. I think they're also great ways to uh, raise our brand. But I'd look really carefully before I walked into one of them to make sure I, I truly understand what it is that uh, they are asking of us and that our constituency, whether it's our members or the families of our kids or our audience, will think that this makes some sense. So now let's go um, to a section where Carolyn and I are going to respond to questions and comments that you have. And um, let's go back to thinking about what were the three points that we were making. That the amount of money that we can raise has to do with the economic um, environment in which we are working. Um, that the maturity of our organization often has to do uh, then influences strongly what kinds of funds we can raise um, without investing too much time or too much money and having a good success rate. And then we looked at each one of those sources of money and thought about, uh, what, as staff, how could we uh, take a look at what money is out there for us. So now let's go to questions and comments. Yes, hi Marilyn, and actually I'm going to bring up, change the view to bring up a slide that has a link for the feedback survey. So that should be uh, coming up soon with a uh, orange link in the middle of your screen. I'm also going to uh, force it open on your browser. We are uh, certainly very interested to get your feedback. And so far, there, um, there's only one question posted during the, uh, during the webinar that I've saved. Um, I, you may have noticed uh, over, in the, over on the left margin where the Q&A is, I, have, uh, I did post the uh, link for our directory of finding our cooperating collections that Marilyn and talked about, you know, where you could go to use our database in your community. And I also, when she was talking about uh, government funding, it reminded me that we have another webinar next Monday, uh, someone from the National Endowment for the Arts talking about how to apply. So I posted the link uh, for that as well. Um, so anyway, the question uh, that was posted it was actually it was when you were sharing the stats from the Americans for the Arts, talking about all the different uh, types of revenue coming in. And Ed, Edward had asked a question. Actually, he was thinking that made him think about fee-for-service income. And he's running an art school. doesn't say exactly what um, type or what his audience is. But uh, they're like, his art school would like to increase enrollment in their classes. So if any suggestions from your uh, an arts marketing perspective, I suppose, or, or trying to, to beef up a, an education program for earned income? That's a good question. And I think for all of us that are on this webinar, we're going to find that oftentimes when we think about arts marketing, we find ourselves thinking about the very same things that we think about when we raise money. So imagine a bullseye. And in the case of this question, in the center of that bullseye are the people who are already taking our arts classes, taking them at the times we're offering, whatever it is we're offering, at the price we're offering. Um, they represent our core market. If they were donors, they would represent our core donors, whether it was foundation or corporate or individual, it would be the same story. So I want to understand them as much as possible. Uh, and I think that it may well be that the individual asking, the colleague asking this question already knows a lot about them. So the first place I would always look in both fundraising and is marketing is where can I get some more of those? Um, it's cheaper to find, and this would be the same if we were selling Avon, it's cheaper to find more of your core audience in terms of marketing or in terms of fundraising than it is to just wander off and look for someone else. The next level would be 
to identify, um, hopefully, there's someone who mans the phones when people call to inquire about these classes. And by the way, it's just not going to work to have people figure out everything online and just sign up. You lose so many people when there's something as complex uh, as a sign up for a class. They want to know if it's good for first graders. They want to know if it's a big class or a little class. They want to know if there's going to be peanuts in the class because their kid's allergic. All these things have to be handled by a real person. And so a big piece of marketing, and by the way, fundraising, is we have to keep the human touch in there somehow or other. So hopefully, as people were calling to sign up and then they chose not to, we have asked whoever is answering the phone to talk to, talk to us about why they said, they said it wouldn't work. So it may be something that's sort of out of our control. Like in Connecticut, you can't put a kid in a class that lasts more than three days unless you have a physical from a doctor. I don't know why there are any arts classes in Connecticut at all or camps. I mean, it's just like a, such a high thing. I'd want to know about that. And maybe I would make a lot of short classes to get around that issue. On the other hand, is it, is it what it costs? Is it how long it lasts? Is it the content? Is it the mix of people? And then the next level is to think about how are our peers marketing. Uh, I know at some level we all want to say, oh, and then let's buy ads. Well, by and large, none of us are positioned to buy a lot of ads. And by the way, uh, there's a lot of research in our arts field that says word of mouth is by far our most powerful way. By far, like 85% compared to 7% with ads in one study. Um, how do we get that buzz going? And I would look like crazy at who else is offering classes in town for people the same age as I am in arts and culture. I wouldn't worry about whether they were the same classes. Not for one minute would I worry. I would look at the same target audience and I would, I would look for the arts and culture, like not football camp. And I would um, look at how they are marketing. I might even you know, buy them a slice of pizza and find out what they're seeing. I hope that's helpful, and I hope that's helpful to everyone. Yes, thank you, Marilyn. And uh, Brittany wanted just a little more discussion uh, when you were talking about corporate giving and talking about looking at subsidiaries. Uh, she just wondered if you could give an example of uh, how that would work and sure. what's a subsidiary company. Okay, so while I'm I'm talking, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Carolyn if she can actually put up the page of the foundation directory online that shows us this box. And Carolyn, if you can't, I I'm not going to worry about it because we'll just go to the foundation directory online and you'll see a tab at the top that says companies. And then when you look in the box of all the choices, you'll see subsidiaries. So let's take cla a class I was, um, that I was working with last week in San Francisco. And I know we have a lot of people here from the West Coast. But by the way, all the rest of you, it's the same for you. So we were looking in San Jose subsidiaries. San Jose, um, you're not going to be surprised to hear, uh, has a big pile of tech companies and software companies, but it, it doesn't have a million other headquarters companies there. It's not a headquarters town. Uh, and when we looked at, at subsidiaries, we found amazing things. Uh, Clorox, I think, was in that area. Uh, Quaker Oats may have been in that area. All that means is that that is one of the places that they bring bulk stuff. Oh, great. Wait, Marilyn, hey. I so wait, what's the, so the city was San Jose? That's the example you're talking about? But let's pick another one right now. Let's pick, well, let's put, let's put in San Jose. Okay. So and we're gonna, this is going to be test Marilyn on if she remembers which example matches with which answer. But it doesn't really matter. <laughs> right. So I did, yeah, they I, have 20. Mm -hmm. And they don't include Clarks, but that's OK. <laughs> I, I'm going to guess that you are seeing here out of, what does this 20 mean? This 20 means that all those corporations, most of them say, we give where we have employees. And then you think, well, they don't have any employees here. You look in subsidiaries. Let's choose NEC. Um, if you can, Carolyn. NEC is a classic example of 
of a company that, that really doesn't like to give anywhere but where it has employees. And I wouldn't have guessed that NEC was definitely uh, in San Jose. And so here we are. We can look at their getting. We can see if they're a good match for us. Uh, but the key is we wouldn't have looked at them at all since they're based in Texas if we hadn't looked at subsidiaries. So I'm a big fan of expanding my corporate search beyond just Wells Fargo or the utility company or whoever the big guys are in town over and over again that we all go to and we love them to pieces because they, oftentimes they give to all of us, uh, to the next level of just who else? Who else has employees here? Um, who would have thought Sony is there? Sony's got a great um, foundation. And then there are Kenyan and Kenyan LLP. I have no idea what that is, but I would like to look. Um, uh, well, I'm going to go back to the presentation so I can see where I we see, are. Because I need to see the questions. <laughs> yeah. And we'll go back. I think you get the drift. Um, and this is either the nice thing about Foundation Directory Online helpful or not helpful. It takes about three seconds to get it up, so it's it's like such a fast way to get smart. Right, and I did, um, yeah, again, once again, if you look over the q and I it's grantspace.org slash find us is the link to figure out your, um, you know, the closest location. I'll also post the, um, we do have a webinar just looking at, well, we have a couple. One is looking at corporate giving, introduction to corporate giving, and another is the introduction to finding funders, which is looking just at the database. So those are two other webinars you can take. Um, but in the meantime, uh, we did have another question come in uh, from Burton. And this is, um, I'm not sure, Marilyn, I, I don't know how familiar you are with the, the fiscal sponsored organization, yes. but it sounds like he's, He's with an organization that's fiscally sponsored. So for anyone who's not familiar with that, that's where you, like a startup where you don't have your own 501c3 and you're working under the umbrella of another organization. So he's asking, at what point in our life cycle, if we're fiscally sponsored, would we need to think about splitting off and you know, would it grow our ability to increase fundraising you know, if we were a standalone organization? I don't know right. if you can answer that in, in general terms. Let's, let's just give ourselves some tips. So if I'm, I'm primarily looking at uh, private foundations and major gifts, and I find in, in my actual interactions with them that they are uncomfortable. So let me give you an example. One of my favorite, favorite nonprofits is an organization called the Amphibian Arc, and they have done more probably to coordinate saving amphibians on the globe than anyone but they didn't want to have high overhead, so they're embedded in another conservation organization. They're now finding to get to the next level of, of funders. These new potential funders are just saying to them, we, we won't give it to you if you're fiscally sponsored. We, we want a real board accountable for what you do. So they're thinking about how they're going to handle that. Um, on the other hand, um, uh, uh, the National Academy of Sciences which has a museum which has been on its own for many, many years, has just moved into Drexel University. They're now to the point where um, they really want to spend a lot more attention, a lot more money um, on their mission. And they found that uh, at the size they were after 2008, uh, their overhead was just too high to keep up with all the reports and everything. Uh, and they're having a very, very positive uh, response from their local funders. So I keep my ear to the ground. There's, this is not magic we're talking about this. This is real, the story of, of being a real organization uh, in your region. I would note that there probably is one truism. If you have a fiscal sponsor, the chances of getting a large federal grant goes way down. Um, that said, are you positioned to get a large federal grant anyway? So uh, I, would, I would listen to my funders and keep growing my funding base and my service, my mission impact. And then when you begin to hear this question, that may be the time to, to go out and get your own 501c3 and become independent. But there are certainly many arts organizations that have gone on for, for decades 
um, and are taken very seriously that are still embedded in uh, another institution or have a fiscal sponsor. All right, well, as you were answering uh, that question, I did post the links for those other couple webinars I had mentioned. So if you're interested in taking uh, more of the research classes, uh, you can register for those. We typically offer them um, uh, at least every four to six weeks. A question has come in sort of along the same lines as uh, Burton's question from Roslyn. Uh, from a startup organization wondering um, what are her chances of fundraising in terms of grant funding or other types of fundraising for a summer arts program that hasn't started. So it sounds like she has a plan, a new nonprofit with a plan to create a summer arts camp, sounds like probably next year. So anything, any tips for what you can do when you're still in the, the um, planning stages and trying to fundraise? Well, if we're a nonprofit that already is respected and has a lot of programming, and now we want to initiate a new summer camp or a new ballet series or a new satellite in some other neighborhood or whatever, um, I think we're going to have a, a relatively easy run of it. We can maybe start with foundations who already love us and uh, move some other programming to foundations. Um, if, on the other hand, we ourselves are a startup, and this is our startup program, then certainly you can look at, um, you can actually um, search on, on uh, categories like seed money to see if um, there is some interest in the arts and in youth in your area. Um, but I'd like to tell you that in my experience wandering around the country uh, and in my own career, I often see these startups come through a contract. So who else wants that? Um, a, your, your public schools, do they want it as part of the summer school? Your parks department, do they want it as part of parks? Um, is there some funding th flowing through the city youth bureau um, to keep kids off the streets that could be organized in this way? So um, if you could find a partner uh, who would actually pay you on contract to do this, you would not only solve your funding problem, but also your, your issue of how am I going to get the kids? Because you know if you get a, cr a grant and you have a hard time getting the kids because no one's looking at you for this kind of service, um, then, then the story goes around in the founding com funding community that you're not very good at this. And that would be most unfortunate. I would really want to find, if I could, a partner and better yet, a contract partner who will pay me, demonstrate we can do this, um, and then move forward again. You could use seed money, but, but also other kinds of funds. Okay, and I have um, actually a question that I know you're very familiar with in uh, teaching uh, foundation fundraising. Judy's asking, when searching for grants, many foundations will not accept applications but are by invitation only. Any strategies you have for uh, managing this? Well, the Foundation Center has a, a great author, Jane Giever, who, um, who actually produces some of their publications and teaches in some of these seminars. I had a chance to work with Jane. So I want all of us to take our hands and rub them together like misers looking at a pile of gro gold and say, more money for me. So, the, so there are two common and very acceptable ways to deal with this. One, believe it or not, is to call up, just call up, and to say, I understand from your website or your guidelines that you do not generally accept proposals, um, but choose to invite them. However, I wanted to introduce our organization and our work because we are working in the same area. Now, you have to let that conversation flow. You can't end it up with, and you sound kind of happy, so can we apply? They will offer if they're interested. But you've only invested less than 10 minutes of conversation, so this is not a big deal. Um, an even more effective way is to uh, include this foundation on your list of potential foundations, the one with the memo that says, attach, please find uh, foundations and other donors who we think might take an interest in our work do you see a trustee uh, or an executive here you recognize? Now, when someone from your board or your volunteers or even another funder comes back and says, I know this person, 
Um, then I'm going to put together my usual packet, my proposal, and my cover letter, and I am going to draft for them, or sometimes they draft for themselves, on their letterhead, and sometimes I help them make their letterhead, a note that says, I am involved with XYZ nonprofit, and I have always thought that you would take an interest in their work. So I've asked them to prepare an introduction, and I've even asked them to put it in the form of a proposal, as I know this is your habit of review. Please let me know if a meeting or a site visit would be helpful and I, help, uh, and I hope that you and John are both doing well. Very personal, um, not pushy, just I think you'd love to know these people. I love them myself. And that personal note goes on top of my package and goes in. That's an extremely powerful way of the opening the door. And I have never seen a proposal that went in in that way that did not receive review, a very courteous review. Hope that's helpful. Yes. Well, I don't see any other questions that have come in, and we are, it looks like we are just at the top of the hour. So I want to thank you very much, Marilyn, for uh, sharing your expertise and insights with us today, and thank everyone for attending, and hope to see you back for future webinars. Have a great rest of your day.